Counsel? Yes, Your Honor, if I may address the court. Yes. Thank you. We would. First of all, it's a good time to do this on the record. There were four DVDs which were lodged with the court on a previous occasion for a pre trial matter that were numbered 913, 1011, and 12, and also 1315, and I don't think they were given exhibit numbers at the time. I believe the court has allowed the clerk to now mark the exhibits 913, 1011, and 12 as 5009A, B, and C. And then the item marked 1315 has been marked as 5010. So we just like the record to reflect that, if we can, Your Honor. First of all. All right. Now, having said that, we would like, as a part of the cross examination of this witness, we would like to play Exhibit 5009A, B, and C, which are the outtakes or Mr. Mosley's footage of the Bashir interviews. And they're offered for the purpose of showing the context and the complete statements made by Mr. Jackson at the time that certain statements were edited out and placed in the Bashir video. And as the court recalls, Statements in the Bashir video were admitted for the truth of the matter as admissions of the party. And these videos show the context in which those statements were made, not just the particular words, but the whole context in which Mr. Jackson was led to make those statements. So that's our offer. Now, I've talked to the district attorney, Mr. Auchincloss. I asked him if he would agree that we could play this in open court without first showing Mr. Mosleyhe to authenticate it, and he is considering that. I think probably will agree to that. The question that he asked that we address right now was the admissibility of this, so I asked the bailiff to ask your honor to come out so we could talk about. I already ruled that it wasn't admissible in the direct part of the people's case, because the Bashir case, the Bashir tape was introduced for the limited purpose of showing that Mr. Jackson had some motive to be doing certain acts that the people claimed that he did, and it had nothing to do with the truth of the matter in the tape although the tape was admitted under certain circumstances for the truth of the matter. So your request is denied. That's the second time I've denied it. All right, let's bring in the jury. Your Honor, could I? No. I don't mean to argue, okay. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Mosleyhe. I believe you testified that you had approximately six or seven meetings with the Arvizo family at various times. Does that sound right? Approximately. Okay. And I believe you testified that Janet Arvizo told you in the phone conversation of the 19th of February, 2003, that she was being hassled by the media. Is that right? That's correct. And she was not happy about that, correct? That's correct. And in your interviews with representatives of the Santa Barbara Sheriff's Department, you have discussed your various discussions with Janet, correct? Could you refresh my memory? Sure, sure. Maybe I'm not being clear. In your interviews with representatives of the Santa Barbara Sheriff's Department, you have discussed conversations you had with the Arvizos, correct? Janet and the kids? Yes. Yeah. And in your discussions with representatives of the prosecution, you have discussed conversations you had with the Arvizos, right? Sure. At no time did Janet Arvizo tell you she thought she was going to be murdered, right? No. She never said that to you, right? No. At no time did Janet Arvizo tell you there were death threats on she and her family, right? That's correct. At no time did Janet Arvizo tell you she or her family were being falsely imprisoned, right? That's correct. At no time did Janet Arvizo ever complain to you that Mr. Jackson was giving alcohol to her children, right? That's correct. At no time did Janet Arvizo ever complain to you that Mr. Jackson was improperly touching any of her children, right? That's correct. At no time did Janet Arvizo tell you her children were being abused by Mr. Jackson, right? That's correct. At no time did Janet Arvizo ask you to call the police on her behalf, right? That's correct. Now, you testified that at Mr. Jackson's request, you did a video at Neverland called, Neverland Channel, right? That's correct. And was it your understanding that was supposed to be a videotape featuring Star Arvizo as sort of the narrator? Well, initially my understanding was that we're going to do a pilot. A pilot is like a sample of an idea in a video format, of an idea that Mr. Jackson have. And you did film that entire video, right? That's correct. And the understanding was that Mr. Jackson would pay for your services in filming that video, right? 
That's correct. You also testified that you did a video of Mr. Jackson with Gavin, right? The 2000? Yes. Yeah. And it was your understanding Gavin was recovering from cancer, correct? Well, Gavin had cancer. I'm not sure whether he was recovering or not, but... But your understanding is he was ill? Yes. And your understanding was that Mr. Jackson also agreed to pay for your services in doing that video, right? Customary, sure. Yes. At no time was it ever your belief that the Arvizos were supposed to pay for any of these videos? That's correct. Okay. Now, you currently have a lawsuit against Mr. Jackson, right? Unpaid invoices, yes. Right. You're seeking unpaid invoices and some other benefits, right? Like? Well, you're asking that invoices be paid. You're also. Damages. Yeah. You're also talking about a profits interest that you claim Dieter and Konitzer promised you, right? That's correct. Now, in your lawsuit, you're also asking for damages related to a, excuse me. You're also seeking damages related to some footage of what you call, Michael Jackson's private home videos, correct? I believe so. And that was another Fox special that was done about Michael Jackson, right? I believe so. And it's your belief that some of your work appeared in that show as well, right? Yes. And it's your belief that you should be paid for your services in that regard, right? For, sure. Yes. Was it your belief that footage you did was going to appear both in the Povich documentary and in another show done by Fox called, Michael Jackson's Home Videos? No, I was never been informed that there is a second documentary. Do you know, as you sit here today, whether or not there was a second documentary? I did not know there was a second documentary, meaning nobody informed me that there's a follow-up, another piece of documentary called, Michael Jackson's Home Videos. Did you learn at some point that that had happened? Yes. When did you learn that there had been a second documentary called, Michael Jackson's Private Home Videos? I believe I've learned that watching TV, been advertised. Okay, and that show appeared in approximately April of 2003, right? Approximately. Did you watch that show on television? Yes, I did. Okay, your belief is you're entitled to a profit participation in whatever revenues were generated from that show as well, right? Well, I guess we have to talk to my lawyer in regard to that. Okay. Because that's a technical question. I'm not a lawyer to make that kind of. Okay, but your lawsuit is currently active, right? It is. Okay. And your claim is that the agreements you had about being compensated for your services and having a profit participation in these television shows were primarily based on what Dieter and Konitzer told you, right? Well, the invoices, it's part of customary transactions between me and MJJ Productions. Right. But the percentage was between Ronald, Dieter and me. Okay, and you don't know whether Dieter or Konitzer ever discussed a profit participation with Michael Jackson, right? With Mr. Jackson himself? Yes. I'm not sure. They just told you talk to them and don't talk to Mr. Jackson, right? That's correct. Okay, now, I believe you said that approximately February 21, 2003, Michael Jackson called you to thank you, right? That's correct. Now, obviously when he called you to thank you, he hadn't seen what you had filmed, right? Filmed what? Well, the footage you did of the Arvizos, he could not have seen, true? Oh, of the Arvizo family footage. But nevertheless, he called you and thanked you for what you had done, right? After seeing, the footage you were never meant to see, I believe that's why Mr. Jackson called me, to thank me. He was talking about the Bashir footage that you had done, is that correct? Objection. Requires speculation. I'll rephrase it. When Mr. Jackson called you to thank you on February 21st, was it your understanding that he was thanking you about what you had done in the Bashir interview? Objection. Speculation. Overruled. You may answer. My understanding for that thank you call was that Mr. Jackson saw the rebuttal documentary, the entire footage you were never meant to see, and because of what I've done. Yes. He's calling to thank me. But he obviously, at that point, had never seen your film of the Arvizo family, right? No. Because you had control of that, right? That's correct. You had never released that, right? 
That's correct. And he was thanking you for what was on that Mori Povich documentary, true? Objection. Asked and answered. Sustained. No further questions, Your Honor. Counsel? Thank you, Your Honor. During the period of time that you were working with the Arvizos on this rebuttal film, you've told us about Christian Robinson, Brad Miller, Paul being present, Vinny being present, you and your crew. As far as you know, was anybody else involved in this rebuttal video? Being involved or being present at my house? That's a good question. Let's add a few names. You mentioned that Frank was involved in it, is that correct? He was involved with it, yes. And Mr. Schaffel was involved in it? That's correct. And Mr. Konitzer was involved in it? I'm, sure. He talked to you about it, right? I think most of the conversation was going through Dieter than Ronald in regard to that. Was Ronald present in that conversation? It was a phone conversation, so I don't know whether Ronald was listening to that or not, or whether they had conversation within themselves. Okay, but you also mentioned a conversation you had in Florida with Ronald and Dieter? That's correct. Did they discuss filming the rebuttal film at that time? At that time, the discussion was about what I had already filmed of Martin Bashir. Okay. There was nothing on the table as far as project goes. Okay. So as far as the project goes, they just told you to talk to Mr. Schaffel? Objection. Leading. Assumes facts not in evidence. I'll strike the question. So as far as the project goes, what did they direct you to do? Once we discussed what I have as far as the footage that I shot of Martin Bashir interview with Mr. Jackson, and once we agreed to certain terms, they informed me and advised me to go to LA and talk to Mark Schaffel. Okay. And the purpose of this, you've testified, was to make Michael Jackson look good ultimately, the whole rebuttal film? That's correct. Okay. So other than the names I've mentioned, were. Were there any other people involved in this enterprise of making the entire rebuttal film, as far as you know? Um, okay, can we go through those names one more time? Just so I don't misunderstand. Okay, Mr. Jackson, Ronald, Dieter. We've got Mr. Schaffel, Frank, Vinny, Christian, Paul. Objection to the question. I don't think it's, I think it's a compound question. I'm asking him for other names. He's clarifying an earlier question. Overruled. Go ahead. Paul, Brad Miller, you and your crew. Well, there was another production company called Brad Lackman Productions. Okay. Which Fox hired to put the final editing together. Very good. Anybody else other than that? Not that I remember right now. When you were engaging in the production or the putting together the various videos that were going to make up this rebuttal film, what were the issues that you were trying to address specifically? Comments that Martin Bashir made on his own documentary. Were there comments that Mr. Jackson himself made that you were attempting to address? On the Martin Bashir documentary? In your rebuttal, yes. Well, we tried to clarify certain statements that Mr. Jackson made which, for example, if Martin Bashir would have continued rolling, I mean, or editing that. Let me try this again. Sure. There were certain statements that were made by Mr. Jackson in the Martin Bashir documentary. Uh-huh. That the way it was edited, what happened is Mr. Jackson sounded different than if they would have continued another two or three seconds of that statement. Give me an example. Um, um. Counsel, I have to ask a question. Why are you going into an area that I told the defense they couldn't go into? My objection sustained. Okay, thank you, your honor. I'll move on. What was the level, well, let me ask you this. Was there any sense of urgency in the creation of this rebuttal film? Objection. Vague. Overruled. You may answer. We tried to get it as soon as possible. Okay. And why was that? Objection. Foundation. All right. I'll sustain the foundation objection. Okay. Do you know why there was a sense of urgency in creating this film? My opinion? Or was there any discussion from any party? Did you discuss the timing issues of this film with any of the people that I've mentioned previously that were involved in it? Well, once this project was sold to Fox, they set up a date, deadline to be aired. Okay. So basically, based on that date, 
We'll try to squeeze everything in there and finish it. And that date was? February 20th. Midnight February 20th, is that right? Well, the deadline to provide the footages was I believe the 19th, February 19th of 2003, to be aired on February 20th, 2003. In terms of the Martin Bashir special, was there any editing done by Mr. Bashir that was problematic, that you saw, that misrepresented Mr. Jackson's statements about him sleeping with children? Objection. Foundation. Leading. Court order. The objection is sustained. It's the area I told you not to go into. All right. Was that area one of the areas that you felt you needed to work on? Same objection. Sustained. All right. As far as the, I want to talk now about the activities that occurred at your home when the Arvizos were being filmed. You mentioned that Janet was, expressed some reluctance to sign this release, is that correct? Objection. Misstates the evidence. Sustained. Did Janet express any reluctance to sign this release? What I saw is that there was a con, a conversation and a discussion between Janet and Vinny and other parties about this release or document that was presented to her. Did that discussion cause any delay in the shooting of the filming? A little bit, a little bit. How many minutes of delay, would you say, if you can characterize it? I would say 15 minutes. And you said that Vinny used your phone number? My fax. Your fax number. Or they could have used my phone, too. Do you know if he used your phone number? To call somebody? Yes. I remember my phone being used, but I didn't know who's calling who or what. But I remember my phone being used. Do you know the number 310-283-5866? That's my cell phone number. That's your cell phone number. Okay. As far as the use of your fax machine, do you know if Vinny made any documents that came from your fax machine? I believe that he either received or sent some faxes through my machine. When Janet had finished with negotiating or talking with Vinny, Christian and Paul, you mentioned that Vinny, Christian and Paul seemed happy previously, correct? It seemed to me that the matter has been resolved, but... Did Janet seem happy, or could you tell? You tell me. Well, when we started filming, she appeared happy. But I don't know, prior to, whether or not she was happy or not. I don't know. Was there a change in her demeanor from before filming to when the cameras started rolling? Repeat that one more time. Was there a change in her demeanor from before the cameras were rolling and she's in your home for this however? I guess you said it was over an hour. To the time the cameras started rolling, was there a change in Janet's demeanor? She seemed more energetic when the cameras are rolling. You were asked if you saw any coaching, and you said, no. Not that I remember seeing any coaching. Do you know if she was coached? I don't know that. Do you know whether or not, did you keep your eye on her the entire time that she was in your house? The entire house? No. Was there an opportunity for her to be coached? Objection. Foundation. Calls for speculation. Calls for a conclusion. Sustained. You mentioned that you went to Neverland at one time for the filming of 60 Minutes, correct? Yes. And was that cancelled? Yes. Do you know why? I don't. As far as the entire documentary, this rebuttal documentary, you mentioned that you were to receive some points? Percentage. A percentage? Yeah. When you spoke to Ronald and Dieter, was it contemplated that this documentary was a for-profit enterprise? For profit? Yeah, would make money. Sure. Do you know if it made money? I think it did, yes. Do you know how much it made? Objection. Foundation. Sustained. Do you know how much, was there any discussion about how much this documentary was anticipated to make with Dieter and Ronald? Well, Fox. Objection. Foundation. Sustained. Did you have a discussion with Dieter and Ronald about the profitability or the amount of money that this documentary or rebuttal could make? Did I have any conversations with them that this documentary will make? Well, we knew there was going to be some money made off of it. Yes. But we didn't know how much at the time. Did you have an idea? Objection. Foundation in court order. It's a, yes, or, no. That's fine, your honor. I'll move on. Now, as far as the, the Arvizos being taken off, the Arvizo children being taken off of Neverland, 
You answered a few questions for counsel concerning that issue when you took the children off Neverland. And you said there was a period of time, I believe it was about a half an hour, between when you first talked to Joe Marcus and he said the children were not allowed off the property and the time when you actually left, is that right? I believe so, yeah. Did you see where he went during that half hour at all? No, I didn't. If you wanted to contact Mr. Jackson when he was away from Neverland, how would you do it? I would either call his bodyguards or his office. Okay, why would you call his bodyguard? Well, that's the fastest way to get to Mr. Jackson. Does Mr. Jackson carry a cell phone? I don't believe so. Do his bodyguards carry cell phones? I think they do. Have you seen this? Yes. If he wants to make a call, do you know what he does in terms of use of a cell phone? Objection. Foundation. Sustained. Have you seen Mr. Jackson ever use a cell phone? Objection. Foundation. Calls for speculation. Beyond the scope. Overruled. Have you seen Mr. Jackson ever use a cell phone over the years you've known him? Dialing it, or just talking on it? Talking on it. I've seen him talking on the cell phone. Whose cell phone would he use? I'm assuming his bodyguards, but I can be wrong. Okay, so after this half hour passed and you left the property, did Joe Marcus offer any resistance? No. Did he seem to be okay with you taking the children off property? Sure. You said that you had a conversation at Neverland with Mrs. Arvizo, and your sense was that she approved of you taking the children to your home. I believe that was your testimony. You correct me if I'm wrong. Is that accurate? If I remember correctly, after I had a conversation with her, my understanding was that she's going to participate in this rebuttal documentary, but she's not going to be at Neverland, so therefore we went to LA. Okay, so that was on the evening of February 19th? That's correct. And your deadline was midnight on February 19th, is that correct? That's correct. Was an arrangement made with Brad Lackman Productions that if you got the Arviso film to them by midnight, they would still be able to incorporate it into the final production of the rebuttal film? If I remember correctly, if we had any additional or new footage that we wanted to put into this documentary, should be delivered no longer than midnight 19, February 19th. Okay, if you delivered it on February 19th before midnight, was it your understanding there was still time to get it into the final version? Yes. And your testimony is that you didn't make that deadline? Yes, we missed that. When you originally talked with Dieter and Ronald about being paid the money that you were owed, was it understood that upon the completion of the Arviso film, you would be paid, the filming of the Arvizos? Upon airing, the footage you were never meant to see. Okay, and the Arviso footage was just part of that? That's correct. All right. Did you anticipate that you would be getting a payday, in other words, a payment of all the money that was owed to you, after the 20th of February? I was expecting the 21st, by midday, I would receive my payments in full, plus what they promised me. Okay, are you aware of whether or not this documentary was also sold all over the world? It is sold all over the world. Okay, this rebuttal film was sold all over the world? That's correct. In terms of the filming of the Arvizos, the footage that you obtained, is this footage, was this footage at the time, did you consider it to be valuable? Objection. Vague. Sustained. At the time that this footage was filmed, you understood that it was not going to make it into the Brad Lackman production, correct? Well, I was hoping that I can get it done by midnight. Okay. But once we passed the deadline, I figured it's not going to happen. And you shot it anyway because of what? Well, because I was told to, and also I wanted to do my job. I mean, I had a responsibility and I wanted to do that. And who specifically told you to shoot that footage? I believe it was arranged through Mark Schaffel and Dieter, those people. Did you discuss with anybody the fact that you weren't going to make the deadline and that you should go ahead and shoot it anyway? I don't remember discussing the deadline with anyone. This was just in my mind. Okay. So that was your decision to go ahead and shoot it anyway? Well, I figured since I had my crew and equipment ready, if they are happy to participate, get it done at least. Was there a discussion at the shooting about the deadline, that it had to be done by midnight? I think I mentioned to one of these guys that, guys, we're not going to make it anyway. But. 
Do you know if either Christian or Paul or Vinny knew about the deadline? I'm not sure about Vinny, but I'm sure Christian and Paul should have known about the deadline. And I believe your testimony is that Christian wanted the video to take with him? They wanted to take the tapes that night, yes. Even though it was too late to put it on the... That's correct. All right. If you, are you familiar with the value of footages such as this, you know, footage concerning a family that is of public interest on the open market? Objection. Vague. Court order. I'm unfamiliar with the court order, but... I'll sustain the objection. It's the restrictions of placed on financial information. All right. You testified that you gave Janet Arvizo $2,000, considered it a loan, and were asked a number of questions about financial conditions involving Janet Arvizo. Would it have made any difference to you in giving Janet Arvizo this $2,000 if you learned that some people gave her some money three years earlier based upon Gavin's illness? Would that have made any difference to you? Calls for speculation and misstates the evidence. Overruled. You may answer. Um, can you repeat the question one more time? My question is, you gave her this $2,000. Okay. You previously stated you were concerned about Janet. Her world was upside down is what you've said. Would it have made any difference? Would it have prevented you from doing this act of generosity or kindness if you knew that years earlier she had received some money for charitable, from charitable individuals to help Gavin? Would that have made any difference? I believe, depending on the timing and the amount of money, it could have been. Okay, so let's say she got $20,000 to help Gavin with his illness in terms of creating a safe room for him, that type of thing. Three years prior? Yeah, would that have made any difference to you? For 20,000 three years prior, no. And what about if she got a civil judgment for about 30,000 three years prior, would that have made any difference? Three years. Objection. Misstates the evidence. Overruled. You may answer. Three years, 30,000, no. Okay, you were asked if she told you some things about her circumstances at the time. Did Janet confide in you anything other than the fact that her world was upside down at that time? I don't remember. Okay. Did you have a relationship with Janet where she would sit down and confide with you details about her problems, other than what you've stated? Did I have a relationship? Such as? Is she the type of person that would sit down and confide in you personal things? I believe because I worked with her kids a lot during a few other productions, she kind of felt comfortable to just empty herself of whatever she had in mind, I guess, at that time. And did she do that in that phone conversation with you at Neverland? Did she did that on that conversation? Yeah, that you had when you were at Neverland. I believe the way she was expressing her, you know, personal life matters, in this case being upside down because of the media, I felt like, you know, she needs a shoulder to cry, kind of things. Did she do that any other time? No. When you were, well, I want to go through this time period of February 20th to the 21st. And I want to talk particularly about your conversation with Mr. Jackson on that. First of all, when you talked to Mr. Jackson after the filming, or after the airing of the rebuttal film, you mentioned that you talked to him about some financial problems that you were having with him and his production company. I believe what I discussed with him is that my invoices are not being paid. Yes and also some other issues. Did you talk to him about the fact that you were also promised some, a percentage of the rebuttal film? I don't think I went that far. But I just wanted to keep it simple and, you know, short with him, just so, you know, whomever he needs to call, please call, because I'm not being paid. Did you explain that you hadn't been paid in years, or over a year, I guess it was? I'm not sure whether I mentioned the period of time that I'm not getting paid, but I said that my invoices are not being paid, and I. Did you mention the amount of money that was owed to you? I don't remember. Okay, and what did he tell you to do about these problems? He asked me to call David Legrand, his lawyer. And did you call David Legrand? Yes, I did. And you told him about the problems? Well, he knew the problem. I told him that, Mr. Jackson wants to talk to you, so why don't you call Mr. Jackson? Okay, did you mention to him that it was about finances? I, well, I don't remember specifically on that conversation whether I spoke or not. But during the day, during the whole entire day, I'd been calling them and asking, you know, what is it with my payment?
so they were well aware of that I'm not being paid, that they have not made the payment. Sometime later in the day, did you receive a fax from David Legrand that same day? I believe it was the 21st, yes. If I may approach, your honor. Is that a marked exhibit? Yes, it is. Mr. Moslehi, I show you exhibit number 851. Appears to be a two-page document with a fax page on the first, and the top being, at the top of each page are the words, Hale Lane. Do you recognize that document? Yes, I do. What is it, please? This is a letter from David Legrand dated February 21, 2003. It was faxed to me, and is telling me that my services are no longer required. And then also Mr. Weisner and... Objection. Hearsay. Okay. I'll ask you, is this the document that you received from Mr. Legrand in response to your conversation with him that he should call Mr. Jackson? That's correct. And was a copy of this letter. Does this letter indicate a copy was sent to Mr. Jackson? Um. Foundation. It says carbon copy. Just a moment. I'm sorry. This is offered as foundation. All right. Overruled. Does it indicate that a copy was sent to Mr. Jackson? This letter is signed by David Legrand and its carbon copy, CC, to Michael Jackson, Ronald Conitzer, John Genga. And the facsimile page on the front, the first page, does it also indicate that copy was sent to Mr. Jackson at Neverland Valley Ranch? That is correct. All right. Offer 851 into evidence, Your Honor. Objection. Foundation and hearsay. I need to see the document. Yes. It is offered as an authorized admission, as well as it is offered for non-hearsay purposes to show knowledge on behalf of the defendant. There is one further authentication issue that I will mention, that this is defense discovery to the people, so this is a copy of a document that's in the defendant's possession. That doesn't authenticate anything. The only foundational issue that I just have a quandary about is how he knows that this is from, who it purports to be from. It's a response to. No, how the witness knows, not how you know. No, I mean his testimony is that he called Mr. Legrand that day and received this letter. I'd like to hear from, I'll allow you to, before I rule on the foundation issue. I'll allow you to ask him any other questions you have on that issue too. Thank you. Authenticate that. Mr. Moslehi, how long after the conversation with Mr. Legrand on the 21st, First of all, let me ask you, did you receive this communication, Exhibit 851, before or after you spoke to Mr. Legrand on the phone? After. How much time after? A few hours. And this document references a communication regarding future, your business affairs that is, that you are to have with Dieter Weisner and Ronald Konitzer on February 24, 2003. Are you aware of that? I'm sorry, um. If I may show you the exhibit again. Page 2, paragraph 2. Objection. I'm not sure what the procedure is. Excuse me. Well, I'm. Why are you showing him the document? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll go about it the proper way. Wood. Does this letter have a paragraph in this indicating that you are to communicate with Ronald Konitzer and Dieter on February 24, 2003? Yes, it does. Did you communicate with them on that date? And prior, yes. Did you discuss this letter with them? Yes, I did. Did they appear to understand and know about it? They were playing games with me. Okay, but did they pretend that they didn't know about this letter, or did they? Objection. Leading. Foundation. I'll strike the question. Sustained. May I ask the next question? Yes. What do you mean they were playing games with you? I would call Dieter, and Dieter would say call Ronald, and they were not responding to my phone calls properly. And they told me this was probably a misunderstanding, or, you know, games. All right. They were not sincere about their statements or, you know, whatever they had in mind. I would offer 851 into evidence at this time. Same objection. How did you know that that letter came from Mr. Legrand? Because it was faxed from his office, and it had a cover sheet and it's signed by Mr. Legrand. Did you recognize that signature? I believe it was the first time I saw Mr. Legrand's signature, but I had every reason to believe that that was from Mr. Legrand. 
All right, I'm going to reserve ruling on that. I have some problems with your foundation. Okay, I'll ask a couple more questions along those lines. Have you subsequently received any faxes from Hale Lane, attorneys at law? After that? Yes. Yes, I have. Did they look identical in terms of the appearance of the fax letterhead? Yes, they did. Have you subsequently received letters from David Legrand? After that one? Yes. I believe maybe I received one or two, and then he started communicating with my lawyer. Okay, as far as those letters go, did they match, did the signature match? I never tried to look into the signature, see if it matches. Once I received that letterhead, I had every reason to believe that it's coming from David Legrand. Did you, this is a fax letter with a fax letterhead. Did you subsequently receive this letter by way of US mail? I don't believe so. Okay, thank you. No further questions. All right. May I see that exhibit? Uh-huh. Mr. Mosleyhi, if you had known that Janet Arvizo was living with someone who earned close to $80,000 a year, would you have loaned her that $2,000? Objection. Assumes facts. Overruled. You may answer. If I knew that Janet Arvizo was living with another husband or just a person that has $80,000. Who was supporting her and who earned close to $80,000 a year, would you have loaned her the $2,000? Well, at the time, my state of mind was different. I don't know. Today, probably not. Okay. Now, the letter that the prosecutor just showed you, which purports to be from the Hale Lane Law Firm, is dated February 21, 2003, right? That's correct. And you claim you did receive this letter, right? That's correct. And in the letter, you were asked to return tapes, photos and other property of MJJ Productions by a certain date, correct? Yes, it is. The date you were supposed to return those properties was February 24, 2003, correct? I, I'm not sure. I don't have it in front of me, but if you say so, I take your word. Okay. And the letter suggested that your invoices will be addressed, correct? I'm not looking at the document, but if you say so, I take your word. And at some point after this letter was received, you obtained or received payment of $200,000, correct? I believe a month after I received that letter, approximately a month after, I received. So approximately late March 2003, you received payment of $200,000, true? That's correct. You never returned the tapes or photos referred to in the letter, true? What does it refer in the letter? Any tapes, photos or other property of MJJ Productions, or Michael Jackson or his affiliates. I don't, after 21st, I don't believe so. Okay, to date, you haven't turned over all the tapes you did for Mr. Jackson, true? Since my invoices were not paid in full, no. Okay, no further questions. Was that 851 that you were quoting from? Yes. All right, I'll admit it. No further questions. Your Honor, we do have a motion, and it probably ought to be heard before this witness leaves the general vicinity. You have no other questions of this witness? No, Your Honor. And you have no other questions? No. Depending on the ruling on the motion. Is it a motion that you already tried to make this morning? No, no, Your Honor. Why don't you approach and tell me what it is? Discussion held off the record at sidebar. What I'm going to do is require that the witness remain at the courthouse and call your next witness. I think the way we'll handle this, the motion that the defense wishes to make, is that we'll stop a few minutes early so the jury gets a longer lunch, and we'll listen to the motion. Come forward, please. When you get to the witness stand, remain standing. Face the clerk and raise your right hand. I do. Please be seated. State and spell your name for the record. My name is Terry Paulson. T-E-R-R-Y-P-A-U-L-S-E-N. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Would you mind scooting up by that microphone, please? Okay. And swivel that towards your mouth so that everybody can hear you. How are you this morning? Fine. Ms. Powelson, who are you employed with? 
Huntel Systems. What is your position with Huntel Systems? I'm a senior billing analyst. How long have you been working in that capacity with Huntel? 27 years. And are you here today as the custodian of records for some documents from Huntel Systems? Yes. What kind of documents? Their phone calls made from an aircraft, telephone calls. Air to ground telephone calls? Yes. Pursuant to a search warrant, did you provide the documents that I'm going to hand you marked as Exhibit 850, previously shown to counsel? Yes, these are ones I provided. Could you describe those documents briefly for the jury, please? It's phone calls made from an aircraft on February 7, 2003. And the company that bill was sent to? It was sent to Extra Jet out of Santa Monica, California. With respect to the contents of that exhibit, is that generally a phone bill? Yes, it is. Okay. And is your company a company that bills for phone calls made from aircraft to the ground? Yes. Does the document reflect information that's made in the regular course of the business of Huntel? Yes, it is. And Huntel is a telecommunications provider? Huntel is, we're the billing vendor. Okay. Is it part of your business to keep track of the kind of records that you're? Yes, it is. Okay. Now, the entries in the phone record, do they begin on a particular page in that exhibit? They begin on page 4. Okay. Is there a page 2 or a page 3 in exhibit 850? No, there is not. Okay. Do you recall what is actually contained in the record of page 2 and 3? One of it is just information on paying your bill by a credit card. The other was phone calls that did not pertain to the date that we were requesting to provide. Is it customary to provide only what is reflected in the search warrant, as far as your company is concerned? Yes. And their request was for February 7, 2003? February 7 or 8, but there weren't calls on the 8th. Is the information on that document relied upon by your company in the regular course of its business? Yes, it is. Okay. And do you rely on it being accurate? Yes, I do. And briefly describe for the jury how the information in those phone records is generated. When a customer makes, or is flying in an airplane and they make a call, it goes from the airplane to a ground station, out a landline to the party that's being called. And when the call's completed, then the ground station records that in its memory. And once a week, we go into the system, we, through a modem telephone line, computer program, we get that information out. And once a month, we process that into a telephone bill so it puts it in a format that can print on a bill, reads the information that's taken from the ground station. Does the ground station have an identifying number that shows up on the bill? Yes, it does. And, well, your honor, at this time I would offer 850 into evidence as a business record. No objection. It's admitted. What I'm going to do, Miss Powelson, is use the Elmo. Input 4. If you don't mind, your honor. All right. If you would turn to line 25, I would just like to show you a sample line from this. If you could just start with the number 25 and explain to the jury what the items mean as you go from left to right as you look at the exhibit, please. Okay. Each call has its own item number. The date would be 207, would be it was made February 7th. They called El Monte, California. The phone number, the 626 number, is the number that they called. 6.57 p.m. is the time that they hung up from the call. So the call was made one minute prior to that, and one minute tells you how long the call lasted. CCD, just means, years ago when these numbers were issued to companies, they were called calling cards. So it just, CCD, is calling card. Then that there's two charges per phone call, or the call's broken out into two different sections. One is the land time, and that's from the time, if I called you, you picked up the phone. From the time you pick up the phone till you hang it up, that's the land time. The air time is what is actually charged, and that's the time from when I pick up the phone in the airplane and I hang up the phone. That's the air time, so there's two different times. And you can tell by the time of day or by the number called which two calls go together. So in this case, call 25 and 26 would go together. It was made over Troy, Alabama, and the phone number under that would be the phone number for Troy, Alabama. Is the number for the Troy, Alabama, place a ground station? Pardon? Is that what you would call a ground station? 
The ground station phone number. How does the wireless phone on the aircraft decide which ground station it's going to repeat at? Do you know? Okay, as you're flying, the transmitter in the phone will pick up the strongest signal on the ground station. The ground station sends up signals, and it picks up the strongest one. So you don't have a choice of what station you're going through. It just picks it up and places a call. So if you're flying near Troy, it's going to pick up the Troy, Alabama, ground station. Now, with respect to the date stamp specifically on item 25, it says 6.57 p.m. Is that 6.57 p.m. in any particular time zone? Or can you explain that for the jury, please? The time zone is the time zone that the ground station is located in. So if you're flying over Troy, Alabama, that would be the time of day at Troy, Alabama. If you're flying over Los Angeles, California, it would be the Los Angeles time, so there could be a difference in the time zones. Okay, Miss Powelson, I wasn't done with the Elmo. If I could direct your attention, please, and if I could have input four again, your honor, to line number 40. Okay. And is that a call placed to Santa Inez, California? Yes. You can read the area code and the number, please. The area code is 805-688-9979. And the time of that call, please? Is 8.39 p.m. And where is the aircraft now? The aircraft is over Artesia, New Mexico. Okay. Could you please flip to the second page of the exhibit? Page 5? Yes. And just tell the jury what time the last call was recorded from that aircraft. Line item 71? Yes, please. It was placed at 9.28 p.m. on February 7th over Grand Canyon, Arizona. Okay. Thank you, Miss Powelson. No further questions, Your Honor. Could I have that? Certainly. Just leave it up on the thing. Oh, on the... Your Honor, I'm going to put this back up on the Elmo and... Okay, it's your understanding that this reflects telephone calls made from an airplane that are eventually connected through to some landline somewhere, correct? Yes. And when I say, landline, it could be connected to a cell phone ultimately, is that right? It would still go through a landline to a cell phone. I mean, it goes out the ground station, however the ground station sends it out. When you're talking about Troy, Alabama, there's some ground station there, and essentially you're now hooked up with the phone system that we would hook into if we pick up the kind of phone we pick up in the courtroom, right? Right. And wherever that phone system then directs the call is the ultimate destination, right? Right. All right, and so just so we're all clear, you got two lines per call, right? Right. And the one line shows the number that's called, actually both lines show the number that's called, correct? Correct. And then the second line shows the charge to the airline, is that right? Right. Now, first of all, the billing goes to a particular airplane or a particular company? Particular company. And so the company that owns the airplane will get the bill? Yes. All right. Can you tell which airplane that belongs to that company was the source of the telephone call? No, I cannot. So if an airplane, private charter airplane company might have several planes, and their phone bill will not distinguish between one airplane and another, is that correct? It will distinguish between one phone number and another, but not one airplane and another. All right. And on the airplane, you have no idea how big these airplanes are, is that true? They're private aircraft. I'm, I would assume like a jet or something, but I do not know, no. Yeah, so you're making some assumptions, but you don't know how many people, for instance, would be on the airplane, right? No. And you have no way of determining what person on the airplane made the call, correct? No, I don't. So let's assume hypothetically that an airplane had two pilots, 11 passengers, and a crew member. Assume that as a hypothetical. Of those 14 people, would you have any way to determine from your records who made these phone calls? No. Now, I do note that there are some phone calls, a number of them that are. If we look at the exhibit, and this is exhibit 850, I believe, is that correct? You have the actual exhibit in front of you. Yes. And what's on the board is a copy of the same exhibit. Yes. So if we look up at the top there where it says, minute, or, M-I-N. Uh-huh, yes. 
What is the minimum unit of time that will be recorded on your bill? The minimum is. You'll see there's a couple that are short-term charges that are 20 to 30 seconds. But the minimum usually is 30 seconds. But 20 seconds on. Okay. So on this particular bill, the minimum that we see on that page, and I'm taking this off so I can see it up close. The minimum charge, or, I'm sorry, the minimum recorded in the columns on this exhibit is one minute, is that right? Right, so it rounds up to a minute. All right, so if there's a shorter call, it's still going to show up as one minute on the, in that column there, is that correct? Anything over 30 seconds will. And you also, from this bill, do not know if two people were actually able to talk to each another during these phone calls, is that correct? It will connect. If it doesn't connect, it doesn't register. Okay, it connects to another phone, right? Right. Now, this is basically a cell phone in the air, right? Similar to a cell phone. And when you're flying and using one of these phones, you have to basically hit the repeater down on the ground in order to make a connection, correct? Do you know what I mean, or am I using the wrong word? If you can, yeah, rephrase that for me. Well, you said it's like a cell phone in the air. Right. So while you're flying along, your signal from the cell phone in the air has to hit. A ground station. The ground station. And that's called a repeater, is it not, or do you know? Or a cell site? I have no idea. Okay, whatever it's called, you got to hit that thing, otherwise it doesn't work, right? Right. And when you hit it, there are places where you will. You'll hit it and you'll make a connection, but you will not have a clear enough connection to actually talk. Is that correct? There's that possibility, yes. So it's, in that sense, like a cell phone, that you can have bad reception, and you can be saying, can you hear me now? And somebody on the other side is saying, what, right? True. Okay, so you do not know, from all these phone calls, how many actual conversations occurred between human beings where they could hear each other and communicate, is that correct? No. Okay, thank you very much. No further questions, Your Honor. You mentioned that sometimes the airline charges will be together and you need to look at the actual time of a call that goes out? Uh-huh. If I could have the Elmo just one more time, Your Honor. Excuse me. I think we have an example here, line. I'm going to break now for the argument. To the jury, go ahead and take your recess. Oh, the motion. You may step down. Step down. To the audience, all right. Please remain seated. There's a motion that's going to be made. All right, counsel, go ahead. Do you want to make your motion? Yeah, indicating. Oh, I'm sorry. Your Honor, would you like the witness to leave the courtroom? No, she may well want to. She's free to do so. But she doesn't, she's not required. Are we back in session at 11.45, Your Honor? At the end of our break, yes. Go ahead. On behalf of Mr. Jackson, we are making a motion for mistrial based on prosecutorial misconduct. And the grounds for that motion for mistrial are that the court ruled, as Your Honor reminded me, at a 402 motion that we would not be allowed to play this tape in its, in the prosecution's case in chief. Correct. I made another motion contemporaneous in time, having felt that it was appropriate to do so. The court summarily, and I think clearly, denied the motion. And correctly. No, all right, go ahead. Laughter. You don't have to say that. I'm going to assert my Fifth Amendment rights on that. I said that humorously, for the record. I took it humorously, for the record. Thank you. The serious part here, though, is that Mr. Auchincloss deliberately overreached. And the harm is, that having, the court having made such a clear ruling, he attempted to gain benefit from the court's ruling that he wasn't entitled to. Your Honor said we couldn't go into it, so he got up and went into it, and that was clearly inappropriate to start with. And it seemed calculated and intentional. Now, I can't read his mind. But I can't figure out how he could have missed that, after we just had a hearing on it. Your Honor made an admonition. And unfortunately my live note is not hooked up today, so I can't quote verbatim, but Your Honor has it. You gave an admonition to Mr. Auchincloss not to do that, and you explained to him exactly why. That you had just ruled, 
and it's not appropriate for him to go into that same area. He persisted and asked at least two more direct questions that just flew right in the face of the court's ruling. And the questions were not innocent questions that were going around to try to get to something else. They were even more focused, to telegraph to the jury exactly what he wanted them to hear. And he wanted them to hear that, in his opinion, the issue with regard to, as I think he said, something like sleeping with boys was not one of those areas that this witness felt was unfairly portrayed. And he knew that he could get away with that because the court was, at the very least, going to sustain the objection. We already couldn't go into it. There's nothing we could do about it. The bell has been rung, and this jury heard it. I think the harm is particularly significant, because it's been our position that clearly those statements were the statements that were grossly misrepresented by Mr. Bashir in the way he edited the film. So as a result of that, a tremendous amount of prejudice has occurred. It was deliberate on the part of the prosecutor. I say that, and that's my interpretation of what I saw. I don't think there's another reasonable interpretation. It's, there's no other remedy, other than to grant a mistrial and say this is prosecutorial misconduct. It shouldn't have been done. As a result of their willful misconduct, a mistrial has to be granted. And that's our motion. If the court denies that, then we would of course ask the court to entertain some other remedy which I'd ask to be heard on later, but I'm making a motion for mistrial, and I think it should be granted. Thank you. Counsel? To begin with, the questions that I was asking this witness about did not focus upon the material that was produced in the video, the footage you were never meant to see. And those questions were not designed and obviously were not intended to ask him about what was on that final production. My question went directly to an issue that defense counsel spent five pages questioning this witness about on cross-examination yesterday. And I have a couple of those items highlighted, and if the court would allow me, I'd like to project them from the official transcripts. Just read them to me. All right. First of all, your honor, counsel started by asking the question of this witness. And the reason you were being interviewed by Brad Lackman Productions was because the intention was to have some of those parts that you had filmed appear in the rebuttal video, right? And I objected. I say, I'm going to object. Relevancy and beyond the scope. Mr. Mesero. I believe that he opened the entire door, your honor. The court. The objection is overruled. Mr. Mesero. In fact, the title of that documentary on television was, The Michael Jackson Interview. The footage you were never meant to see, right? We go on. He questions him extensively about, the footage you were never meant to see, including charities and Mr. Bashir's remarks. We get to an area here that's particularly interesting in which counsel says, and your belief at that time was that Mr. Bashir had presented a very distorted view of that interview with Mr. Jackson, correct? Mr. Auchincloss, objection, calls for a conclusion. Mr. Mesero, state of mind, your honor. Mr. Auchincloss, relevance, the court, overruled. Now, this is an area that was clearly gone into by the defense, and my questions went directly to that question that defense counsel asked of this witness, that the, that Martin Bashir presented a very distorted view, and my questions went directly to those remarks. You went from the general concept, which I allowed, to the specifics, which I was not allowing. The motion for a mistrial is denied. All right. We'll take our break. Your Honor, just, if I may. I'll let you address the issue of alternative remedies. I thought you said you wanted to do that later. Well, later, whenever you want. I will. I'll let you do that. Okay. <laughs> 